If I said I had a story of Highland Rebellion, independence and civil war for the Scottish and English crowns, you'd probably think I was talking about 18th century Jacobites. What if I wasn't? Let me tell you a story as I take a hugely complicated period of history and oversimplify it. Now the pedants and purists will complain that there's detail missing, but in this short video I want to boil a multifaceted conflict into four key characters and a trip to a ruined castle. The question is, in weather like this, with a ferry journey to take, will I make it? Well, question number one's answer, doesn't it? The weather conditions were way too difficult and I ended up making a video about some Jacobite history and an Outlander film location just a couple of miles from me. It's now a couple of weeks later and we are heading north and west. Now, the plan was to give you a beautiful view of Loch Tulla in the lovely weather. Fortunately, I've got a picture taken here in the summer. As I tell you about John of Isla, Chief of Clan Donald and Lord of the Isles. Now, let's call the Lordship of the Isles a semi-autonomous kingdom of the Hebridean Islands in the northwestern mainland of Scotland. In Viking times, the Norse had taken over the Western Isles. Through the centuries, the mixing with the original Gallic population created the Gaul Gael, a blend of Celtic and Norse warrior class. Needless to say, warlords had fought amongst themselves to gain control of this island kingdom, then saw independence from their Orkney masters and held it directly from Norway itself. Now, Summerled was the most famous lord of the Isles, but today we're dealing with his successor, 300 years later, John of Isla, Lord of the Isles. By this time, he came under the power of the King of Scots, but John and his MacDonald kinfolk wouldn't have seen themselves as Scottish. Neither would he have seen the prevailing constitutional arrangement as being permanent. On the contrary, he was looking to expand his power base at the expense of and in defiance of the Stuart monarchs of Scotland. By 1461, he'd made forages east and south with varying degrees of success to Urquhart, Inverness and even Ruthven castles in the east to the Isle of Butte and Ayrshire in the south. John had ambitions. But the Stuart kings had enough on their plate with the Douglases. Now the most famous of the Douglases had been James Douglas, the right hand man of Robert the Bruce way back during the Scottish Wars of Independence. He was portrayed as the brave knight that was a bit crazy during the film The Outlaw King. Now, the James Douglas that we'll talk about today was his descendant 140 years later. Douglases had been in and around the Scottish throne since her illustrious ancestor, Sir James. They'd grown to be a powerful family. In fact, too powerful by far. The current James was the ninth Earl of Douglas. His brother, the eighth Earl, had married a cousin. Unsavoury, yes, but it did add the lordships of Galloway and Bothwell to his land and titles. Then he'd made a treaty with John, Lord of the Isles, remember, the first guy. And another guy that will leave until another day. If your head spontaneously explodes with unnecessary names, then you won't be able to like and share my video later. So let's focus. Now, James II of Scotland looked at this treaty between the most powerful family in the south and the Lord of the Isles in the north, and he thought, eh, huh, Cousin Mary might be unsavoury, but this is downright dangerous. So King James invited him round to Stirling Castle for dinner to suggest that he should dissolve his throne-threatening treaty. Now, the Earl of Douglas, who demanded a letter of safety from James to go to the dinner in the first place, felt safe enough to laugh it off and say, no. That's how you end up with 26 stab wounds and your heat stove then and thrown out the windy. Bruce, do you really think foreigners all know that that means stabbed, hit in the head and thrown out a window? It's my video. The precious. The garden in Stirling Castle where his body was thrown still called the Douglas Garden and you can visit it today if you go to Stirling Castle. Anyway, when the multiple stabs came to the ground, the king was ready to kill the Earl of Douglas and his brother and the Earl of Douglas to marry his cousin. 
cousin, the dead brother's wife. That worked out well for me. Relations between James Douglas and James II somewhat frayed, I'd say. Young Douglas attacked Stirling after sending a loose horse careering through the streets with his brother's worthless letter of safe passage tied to its tail. Revenge, you might say. James II called it rebellion. Anyway, by 1461, James Douglas was landless and living in exile in England. Incidentally, if you enjoy my videos, then you can click the subscribe button at the bottom right hand side of the screen at any time during the video. It's a wee red button and ring the notification bell to make sure you're informed when I bring out new videos. Meanwhile, James Douglas is landless in exile in England, but James II is dead after standing over enthusiastically close to an exploding cannon. A wise philosopher once said, what goes round, comes round. Or oh, is that a train driver in the Glasgow Underground? It matters not. Right, the weather's not what the BBC fake news forecast promised. Nevertheless, the third character in today's tale is James III of Scotland. And I can tell you about him quickly as we wait for the corn ferry to take us across to the Ardnamurchan Peninsula. Now, his dad's mishap meant that James was a child king. At the time of our story, James was 12, and the country was governed on his behalf by a regency. All you need to know about James III is that as Scottish kings go, he was famously ineffective, irrationally fearful of his son plotting against him, and meticulously wary of cannon. Oh, and he sided with the Lancastrians in the English War of the Roses. Now, while we've got a bit of time, I read about the War of the Roses in a book called Lancaster and York, The War of the Roses by Alison Weir. Now, in truth, I didn't read it, I listened to it using Audible. Audible's a brilliant audiobook service. I love using it when I'm traveling in the car or going for a walk. You can get that or any other audiobook as part of a, three, a free 30 day trial, and if you like it, then you get an audiobook every month and you can cancel at any time you want. I've had it for years. I'll leave a link to the book that I mentioned in the description below if you use that link to click through and choose any Audible book and sign up for a free trial, then you get a great service and it helps the channel. I'll see you in Arden the Merkin. This brings us to our fourth character. In my video, How Scotland Saved France from England, I explained how Scotland came to France's aid during the Hundred Years' War. As the Hundred Years' War was coming to an end and England's position in France was collapsing, one of the consequences was economic and political instability in England. And these, along with a dual ally monarch, were the root causes of England's War of the Roses. This was a civil war between competing descendants of Edward III. He was the English king that started the Hundred Years' War and the Second War of Scottish Independence, incidentally. Now, obviously, I've got videos on the Second War of Independence. And for Scotland's role in the Hundred Years' War, I'll leave a link at the end. Now, I'm not about to analyse England's War of the Roses. All we care about is the Scottish bit. All you need to know is that in 1461, the White Rose Yorkist king, Edward IV of England, had ousted the Red Rose Lancastrian Dulali king, Henry VI of England. Now here in Scotland, James III gave Henry VI and his wife hospitality, and they were using it to destabilise the north of England. So, we know that the Scots started the English Civil War. You might be asking... Does this mean that Scotland's support for the French in the Hundred Years' War and then harbouring Henry VI was what caused the War of the Roses as well? Tenuous, Bruce. More than tenuous. A huge leap of the imagination. If you answer yes, you'll look daft and you'll get pelters in the comments section. Aye, we probably did. Don't! The point is that in the late 1450s, there was internal strife in England and a fight for the throne between the House of York and the House of Lancaster. 
More importantly, there was a three-way power struggle here in Scotland between the Stuart monarchy, the Black Douglases, and the Lord of the Isles. See, now you're starting to get it, aren't you? Do you want to pick a side? Tell me which in the comments section below. Anyway, all this is why I've brought you here to the ruins of our Tornish castle here on the Morven Peninsula. James Douglas came north here, sent by Edward IV of England, with an offer to John Lord of the Isles. John would strike the Stuart monarch James III from the north, Edward IV would invade from the south, and with the King of Scots defeated, Douglas would get his lands back in the south, John would take the north, and both would be vassals of Edward and, of course, support him in campaigns across the Irish Sea. This was the basis of the Treaty of Westminster or Tornish, agreed here at our Tornish Castle on the 13th of February, 1462. John of Isla did strike south, but no corresponding invasion came from Edward IV of England and the project ended in failure. Well, it ended in failure for Douglas and John Lord of the Isles. For Edward IV, it turned out just dandy. James III was distracted with internal conflict and he withdrew his support for Edward's competitor, Henry VI, who Edward captured and put in the Tower of London. But for the Lordship of the Isles, this was the beginning of the end. James III grew to maturity and he reasserted control. There was an internal strife amongst the Macdonalds and the power started to wane. Other smaller clans grew in strength. James III authorised the Campbells of Argyll to take on the Macdonalds of the Isles. This was the turning point that saw the rise of the Campbells and the end of the Lordship of the Isles. James IV would appoint himself as Lord of the Isles. His descendant, James VI, would later suppress Gallic language and culture with the statutes of Iona. But the slippery slope had begun. At the start, I said that you'd probably think this story was about 18th century Jacobites. It's not unreasonable to say that the coup de grace to the Highland way of life was administered with Culloden and Clearance when Highland clansmen supported the Stuart cause. But the first cut was made when John, Lord of the Isles, moved against a Stuart king with the signing of the Treaty of Westminster or Tornish here in 1462. Now you can click on the link in the description below to find that free audible trial, but I also promise videos about Scotland's role in the Hundred Years' War and links are coming up on the screen now. In the meantime, Hamidoch is going to be Lam Cheerio and Rasta.